Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our inaugural episode of Sharp Ideas, where we bring you the stories behind some of the world's most successful artists and the organizations, companies, and projects they've created. My name is Natalie Higgins, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jonathan Batia and Martin Hackleman. And today, we have a man on whose sharp idea revolutionized the role of the brass instrument on the concert stage. Before 1970, brass quintets represented a small share of the chamber music medium, performing works such as Malcolm Arnold's quintet or one of Victor Ewald's compositions in a standard horseshoe formation. However, in 1970, a new player emerged onto the scene, one whose innovative show elements proved that the brass quintet could hold its own as a major concert attraction and really paved the way for the next generation of brass chamber ensembles. Today, this group is in its 50th season and has performed more than 5,000 concerts, created a library of over 600 compositions and arrangements, and has been honored with 16 Juno Awards and a Grammy. We are happy to welcome Mr. Chuck Dellenbach, founding member of the Canadian Brass, to Sharp Ideas to tell his remarkable story. Welcome, Chuck. <laughs> We're happy to have you. First question, Chuck. You grew up in a musical family. Did you face any unique pressures from your, per from your parents to participate in music? Yes, definitely. Uh, the family, uh, uh, it was very important. The family said you had to play an instrument. You had to sing in the choir. My dad was a, a band director, an orchestra teacher, but he also had church choirs. So we all had to be in the church choirs and show up at the rehearsals and, and uh, be good citizens. So consequently, it was always a, a family affair. And it turned out that uh, uh, later found out the seven generations of musicians in my family, uh, stretching way back to uh, Germany and Switzerland. So, yeah, there was pressure. And were there any of those generations tuba players? Or did you just serendipitously decide to go into brave new waters? Well, actually, my, uh, my grandfather was a, uh, a tuba player, played tuba and sousaphone. So, uh, I think. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what in the world is he reaching for? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Can you see okay. the family band? Oh, wow. And that's my grandfather on tuba and my dad on trombone. So, yep, it was family. Okay, okay. so family. You, got, you got bass clef in your blood. <laughs> <laughs> so how much did you, your what? parents make you practice? Well, actually, I didn't. I, I never was a, a practicing person. And uh, uh, Marty will certainly uh, confirm that later in life, too. <laughs> but uh, since my dad was a, a player, every night after dinner, he would take out his horn and, and play. And I would just play along. So... I've always uh, thought of uh, the idea of a teacher and a coach and all that sort of thing, more of a uh, learning to play through, well, what became performance. Mm. So that kind of set the tone for the, for the future. And we know summer festivals are often a large part of our development as musicians. Did you find the same to be true when you attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison summer program? They had just started, when I was in seventh grade, they just started a seventh grade program. They'd always had a senior program for uh, high school kids, but they actually started a junior one as well. So from seventh grade uh, right through 11th, uh, I'd spent my summers in, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, which was very pleasant, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, then I trailed my dad out to uh, uh, Colorado, where there was a band festival and got to meet Arnold Jacobs out there. And... Um, also started Eastman about that time. So that changed the course from, uh, from University of Wisconsin being the point to uh, uh, ending up uh, really studying with, with Mr. Jacobs. Ah. Can you tell us, tell us about that special experience? Because obviously he's a demo, you know, he's, he's famous by everybody. But in those days, mm -hmm. you got a chance to see him when he was really before he was an icon. Um, <laughs> did, you, did you sense that... Uh, when you met him then and all the life, during the life, the next decades, how did it change? What did you take away from that, the beginning and the end? Well, he was always a, 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 a it, it was more like therapy than it was lessons. You know, looking back, um, I don't remember playing an etude from one end to the other. He would always concentrate on tone and uh, ease of playing. <clears throat> so that was uh, very different than teaching methods at that time. I think now, um, it became a rite of passage. Every, every wind player had to uh, visit Mr. Jacobs and mm -hmm. uh, set the... But, um, in the time that uh, 
it was it was very lucky time. In Colorado, they had a Gunnison, Colorado, and it was for band directors basically, and then some young kids. So trailing my dad out there for a dollar and a quarter, you could get a half an hour lesson. So I bought. <laughs> Jesus. I bought uh, uh, three tickets to study with Mr. Jacobs and three to study with Mr. Bell. Bill Bell was out there as well. And I took my first lesson with Mr. Bell. And then the second one was with Mr. Jacobs. And the first thing that uh, Arnold said to me, he says, now, has anyone ever told you to uh, take uh, quick breaths through your nose? Like if you're playing fast, you need a breath to take a quick breath. I said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, just recently. He said, well, uh, that's not a good idea. So I went and traded in all my tickets for Arnold Jacobs. And, uh, and then uh, in summers, well, even when I was in college, I would drive down and study with, uh, with Arnold. And I think at this time, too, Chuck, you, you were accepted into the East Minn Accelerated Bachelor's Program, um, which sounds like a very unique experience. Can you tell us a little, little bit about that and whether it still exists today? Well, they had a nice idea at Eastman that they would let uh, kids come in after junior junior year in high school, <clears throat> take a summer course, back to high school, come in the next summer, and then do the fall experience. Um, one really big success story of that is uh, Ralph Sauer, the, the wonderful trombonist, uh, played in the Los Angeles Philharmonic for years. Well, the not so successful year was ours, I guess, because they canceled the program. However, <laughs> I did make it. So I started my first year, my freshman year uh, was the summer and the first year of college was the sophomore. So I was able to zoom through in three years and then I went right into a master's and doctoral program because uh, as you know, and Marty, you can confirm this as well, um, your degree kind of tells when you, uh, when you actually get a job. Right. So some people don't even get a bachelor's degree, they get a job right away and some get a master's degree and then connect with the job. Well, I have a doctorate. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's very unusual if someone stays in one institution for all three degrees. What, what do you think, why did you do that? What do you think the advantage or disadvantage of, of how, what that is? Well, the advantage was pretty simple. When I started the master's program, I didn't have to take a history or theory test because oh. they assumed since I'd already been in school, they, they would be negating their own program if they said, well, we don't think you're up to snuff. Well, oh, I see. Well, wait, <laughs> I studied here. I like that. That's nice. <laughs> so was your plan uh, from the beginning to form an internationally recognized chamber ensemble and it just <laughs> took you that long? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think the, um, the real advantage of going to the same school was that I knew people so well and uh, it was, it was yeah. easy to get, navigate. And I've seen a lot of people get stuck in doctoral programs, DMAs and PhDs and so forth where they are out working, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, actually you sure. should go out, work for six, eight, 10 years, then come back and get a proper doctor. However, they often get stuck because the uh, rules change in the meantime. Mm -hmm. So I saw people while I was zooming through in three years for a doctorate, I saw people coming back, you know, for their fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth summer, still trying to figure out how to navigate those rules. Um, I think for uh, music education, and that's, I was in the music education program, there's a pretty strong um, reason to go out and work for a few years and then come back and uh, do the next degree. But it was the uh, Vietnam era, it was a good time to stay in school for a little while, and by luck, by the time I finished, they had the lottery in place, and, um, just yeah. worked to my advantage, and then I came to Toronto to teach. So that's really where the, uh, the, the story of the Canadian Brass really begins, 1970. Mm -hmm. right, right. So you land this job in Toronto and you finally get a chance to meet Gene Watts and then you get involved with the Hamilton Philharmonic, which was a matrix for a lot of, what, of the early development of the Canadian Brass, mm -hmm. but it had a unique situation. It was your typical little orchestra and Canada was nothing nearly typical at this in the States. So can you tell me, Tell us all about what made that a unique situation to your advantage in Canadian brass films. Well, and uh, very much so. Brass. Gene had been in the uh, Toronto Symphony. He'd been principal trombone for a few years. And uh, he wanted to get out front, play solos, and play contemporary music and so forth. So he'd been trying to put a brass quintet together to do uh, various. There was a, a children's program called Prologue to the Performing Arts, where an organization sent musicians out into the schools. 
So he thought that was a good base to create a group and do that as a, as a foundation. But there was no tuba player appropriate in, in Canada. God bless Canada, a wonderful time to be on the ground floor of brass playing yeah, in 1970. You'd be 300,000 people in the whole country. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, uh, so the recommendation that I got early on was to, to call the Hamilton. The Hamilton had a, uh, Hamilton, Ontario had a uh, community orchestra. And in many ways, it was the world's finest community orchestra. I called and they uh, also were looking for a tuba player, just happened to be the right time. Mm -hmm. And my first rehearsal, I'm there and I, I realized there's brass players from Toronto were coming down there to fill out this small regional orchestra. And uh, I met Gene in Hamilton and we, we uh, I was thinking I was putting a group together and only to find out he was putting a group together. And we, we, uh, we had our first, I guess, rehearsal test to see uh, if it would be possible. And from those humble beginnings, our idea was just that uh, we were hoping we could get to the point that we could play, so you go out on a weekend and play a couple of universities or colleges, come home and do whatever it was we were doing, our regular job. So we always had the um, kind of the small hill principle, climb to this one, see what's, what the next one looks like, and then climb that one. Uh, our, we never, we, we, we had no idea at that time, I mean, not even a clue that, that it could expand the way it did, but it was just a, uh, you know, paying attention to audiences, finding out what people wanted to hear, and the fact that we really loved playing brass quintets. We were sharing something. We weren't, we weren't doing that to make a little extra money or something. We were, we were seeing how far we could take a brass quintet into the communities, yeah. and, and that's that really set the tone. And, and along with that, Chuck, can you tell us a little bit about like what your first concerts were like, who your audience was, and. So maybe some elements you guys tried. Did you start sitting down and with standards or did you come out with a bang right from the start? <laughs> well, we had the same repertoire that you, you mentioned, the Malcolm Arnold and the Victor Ewalds and all <laughs> that sort of thing. But it didn't take a genius to figure out that no one had made a career with this repertoire. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you compare this repertoire with a any string quartet, look, a string quartet can spend a lifetime just going through Beethoven's and Haydn's and, and so forth. Uh, pianists can play their, their practice material. They can take etudes and have a Carnegie Hall recital playing Chopin etudes. Uh, brass can't do that. You can't go out with the Koprash horn studies or the, the uh, Blazevich trombone studies on the Carnegie Hall stage. We don't have that. And the uh, composers, the really fine composers hadn't really uh, turned their attention. Brass was invented in the 1800s, just about time to be part of these big orchestra experiences with Mahler and Bruckner. So we went right to the back of the orchestra. It, uh, we missed that whole kind of early chamber music period. So we knew we had to, to steal or borrow the best music. And we thought if we we're going to steal and borrow music, it should be the very best. And of course, you start with Bach and Handel and so forth. And off we went. So did you have comedy and choreography and memorization? How long did it, when did you start implementing elements such as those? I think that grew more out of our children's concerts than the adults at first. We were trying to figure out how to exceed the, uh, the 55 second, I think uh, Sesame Street had determined that children had a 55 second attention span. And we were trying to figure out how do you play a three minute piece by Bach <laughs> to children that will sit for a minute. And that was the challenge. It was a wonderful challenge because it, it made us really think about how you connect and what you need to do to connect with an audience. And how do you build that audience and how do you, how do you take them from one piece to the next and really with, with valid material without I think a lot of musicians tried to, they tried to, you, you know, the word sell out. You can't. There's really no way. If, if, if you're not true to your own values, you know, it's not, it's not going to go too far. Mm -hmm. So we were taking repertoire that we loved and then presenting it and saying, okay, now how do you present that so that you really become uh, one with that audience? How do you really, really become part of that experience? And you, you, you had to concentration from a, the, having to keep kids still and, uh, and then transfer that intensity and interest uh, maintaining ability to the adults. How did that transmogrify itself from 
doing kids shows and then taking that, that unique sensibility of, of, of a new chamber idea to adults who actually were at least as much entertained or more. How did it, how did it mature that way? Well, I think by not having a path to a career, we didn't have rules and regulations. I think a, a certain audience that attends a symphonic concert or a, or a string, uh, string quartet concert, they are told to have, they are informed they should have expectations. They're told how to respond in those relationships. Don't applaud between movements and don't cough and don't move and don't say anything and don't, you know, don't express yourself. And that's the musicians are there to be observed and so forth. Well, brass didn't have any of those rules and regs. So we figured we had more latitude to see what we could do. For example, um, I remember very fondly our, our, our piccolo trumpet player, Freddie, walking out on stage one night, one day. He had the piccolo in his hand. The entire audience watched him walk from the side to the middle. You, you, you know, you look out in the audience, you can see where their attention is. It's seldom on the tuba, by the way. I'm not complaining, just it's <laughs> anyway. <laughs> He walked in and all the eyes were on that piccolo trumpet and you could hear the audience think, what is that instrument? <laughs> now to us, it's normal. You know, we put our lips on a brass mouthpiece every day and we think this is normal. Well, most people think it's unusual at the very least. Mm -hmm. So instead of just leaving them thinking that and, and for us to say, and very often musicians would, well, they didn't even know what a piccolo trumpet was. Well, we took the opposite of, well, let's tell them what it is. So we simply said, well, this is the instrument. It's uh, half as long as a trumpet. Well, in, in it's about, uh, let's see, a trumpet is uh, uh, four, let's see, four and a half feet long. So a pickle trumpet is two and a quarter in Canada. It's metrics so it's probably half, half as long as that. You know, in other words, yeah. tell them about the pickle trumpet and then just have them play a high note and they know what it does. Mm -hmm. And we started to realize that there's so much that we know just because we do it every day that people would like to know about. They would like to go away a little more informed without becoming, you know, it's not a, a lesson, an instruction, but it, it gives a little, even a little different attitude when someone's listening to a piece of music, when they say, oh, there's that piccolo trumpet. Oh, I see what it does. So listen, it's way up above the others. You've given them a little signpost, something to grab onto and hold onto. And I think this really um, makes the experience quicker Oftentimes, when we bring up these ideas that we've kind of learned from watching some of the best quintets, not everybody is always on board. Did you find that, that it was difficult to get classical musicians to stand up on stage and add these extra entertainment elements? I think once we hit on the idea that we were there as performers and we were trying to, to tell a story and to connect with an audience, the next thing that became obvious is that we all have our own personalities. Uh, for example, I am not an actor. So if someone gives me a script, it's probably going to be, you know, on a scale of one to 10, maybe six, seven, <laughs> if I'm lucky. But on the other hand, I can stand at a microphone and be myself forever. I mean, somebody has to pull me away. So that was something that I could do. And I did. Uh, Freddie, I mentioned earlier, Freddie was very, very uncomfortable at the microphone in those years. But he was a very interesting fellow. And we realized that everything he did he had a certain charisma people would watch him so it was important for him to know that if he needed to go to the back of the stage and pick up mutes that that's part of the show how do you do that so that it's it's uh interesting and how do you shuffle your music and how do you set your stand these are all parts of the thing and i think it's just um when someone's trying to to, to build an ensemble or build a program is to realize that every second counts there's no there's no dead moment. There's no part where you can say, okay, well, now I'm just letting water out of the horn. It doesn't matter if I do it here on my shoes or I do it here. That's part of the show. Make sure that you're aware it's part. It doesn't mean you, it's going to be wonderful. It doesn't mean you, you shouldn't do it. It just means people are watching. Mm -hmm. So make sure that everything that you do on that stage is you know why you're doing it and when you're doing it and for, for what reason. So you ended up with an iconic group, but it likes you, you know, because you're saying it's very, very important that each person contribute and enhance one another. Uh, you can't just sit there and stare at one another and scowl at the audience. <laughs> right. But, but you're the iconic personnel 
where did it, it, it went through some early changes and stuff. I mean, it got perfected in the early 80s, as I recall. Um, uh, <laughs> I think Marty's saying that because that's when he joined the group. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, tell us a little bit about how it, 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 it happened and then it finally coalesced and then you guys, you had your team. Well, I, I could say this about how it worked for us and something that people should be wary of perhaps is uh, I think people would see us play and they'd decide, well, they talk to the audience, therefore we should talk to the audience. Well, it's not true. One of the most interesting performers I ever saw was uh, Rudolf Serkin. Uh, I remember watching a, uh, a program, he'd walk out and you fell in love with him just as he was walking. You wanted him to be your grandfather. You love this guy. Hollywood couldn't have produced a better image. And he'd come out, take his bow, and he sat down and played. It's absolutely normal performance, except it was him. So he didn't, if he'd talked to the audience and done a routine or a joke or something, it would, it would have spoiled the, the, the effect. So the fact that we talked, a couple of us would talk to the audience or a few of us would talk to the audience is because that's who we were. Not because, oh yeah, it says here that uh, at 817, a uh, trombone player has to go to the microphone <laughs> or, or, or one of the trumpets and you send a trumpet up that isn't comfortable doing that. That's, that, that just wasn't, that just well, wasn't I, the way. You know, to put as that I recall over. too, you explained that one of the reasons you developed, because you were playing so many shows in the early days, like kiddie shows and stuff. Part of it is you developed a dialogue routine to keep the attention of the people and give them information to have them cut, you know, mull it over while you're playing. But also we're brass players, we need a little rest. You can't just bend it down, you know? Well, that's a high brass. I think I never thought about that. <laughs> that's a company exclusive. Yes, okay. Yeah, back then we had to worry about trumpet players. People were surprised. When brass players would come to our concerts, they would be sort of amazed that we would hold forth for a two hour concert. That seemed extraordinary at that time. Mm -hmm. Does that seem extraordinary now? Hardly. I mean, everybody. Yeah, thanks for that. Brass players. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, did a, a, we did a bunch of programs with uh, other brass players. I remember playing with the New York Philharmonic guys. We were, we were doing a recording in Philadelphia. They had to get on a train, come to Philadelphia, be there by 9 for the start of the recording. They had to leave by about 4 or 4.30 to catch the train back so they could go and play Mahler. Mm. And played that whole day and not a whimper. I mean, this... In this day and age, that, that, that's gone. But I do remember our trumpet players uh, uh, worrying about, for example, when we played Carnegie Hall, that would seem like a daunting. First of all, uh, both of our trumpet players had gone to school in New York. So Carnegie Hall seemed even bigger than it did to the rest of us. And no brass group had ever uh, had a full concert. I think even chamber music wasn't, wasn't held in the large hall of Carnegie Hall. So this was kind of a, a, a fearful thing. Well. By now, trumpet players, in fact, this show becomes more and more uh, trumpet oriented and uh, endurance hardly figures into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, plus that's also why you have two trumpets, right? Marty, we always had to have two because they take, you know, one. Yeah, the poor, poor things, we had to coddle them through everything. You know? yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So when yeah. you had your arrangements done for you, did you ask for a specific style such as to give players breaks within the pieces or? Well, that's something that uh, the trumpet players particularly mention every time we do a workshop and somebody asks about arranging for brass players is don't have somebody play from one end to the other. <laughs> yeah. you know, there's no reason. Uh, Luther Henderson wrote some great things for us. And by the way, uh, since Marty's sitting right there, I'll say this. Uh, Luther had never heard a horn player like Marty. And that, that jazz repertoire that we have from uh, Luther Henderson was inspired by Marty's playing. And it's, it's right. amazing. Just, just the best stuff. He was. Oh, and you, you created that for him. He had not, he, he had only heard, he'd been in the military and heard some guys duffing through this or that. And he just, he just couldn't <laughs> believe he, he couldn't stop talking about uh, the, how the horn had these great possibilities and That's he awesome. wrote for it, but basically we've had that kind of tailored arrangement for us. We've been very fortunate in that sense that people come in and listen to, to the group and decide, uh, you know, I could write this or somebody that's good at writing melodies. Well, the melody, what a, what a great tuneful horn player, what a tuneful 
trumpet, let's put the melody there, or uh, uh, consequently, there's not much future for two. Oh, well, that's another story. But never, <laughs> no, we would, <laughs> we would always ask composers to really think, think that through. And uh, Howard Cable is a Canadian name up here. Uh, he'd been the conductor of the NORAD band at one point and all sorts of things, wonderful things. He, he would always try so hard at this that it often, uh, I'd say that a, a man that could, he was like Mozart, he, he would already have the piece developed in his head and just copy out the parts. But it was a challenge for him to write specifically. So often we'd get a piece, for example, a, a, let's say a tuba feature and it just didn't work. But he really, really wanted to try to put the melodies down in the tuba and he would try to work that out. So. Uh, by pushing him, unfortunately, he was pushable. He was a reasonable, really a great colleague in that sense. But that it isn't always the best instruction, but it does mean at the end of the day that you end up with a repertoire that's, that's more specific to the ensemble and more specific to the audience as well. Yeah, and, and along with that, I, I know, you know, Canadian Brass spent a ton of time reading new arrangements all the time. Um, is there any advice you'd give composers or, or young arrangers in terms of, you know, maybe some basic things you look for when you're first reading it to decide whether you're going to implement it into what you guys are doing? Well, it's a challenge. You never know where that piece is going to come from. And frankly, uh, Marty, you were part of this as well. All the commissioning that we did, mm -hmm. uh, I think we commissioned over 100 major works. We had the Canada Council who had money for composers up here through that period. Out of that uh, 100 pieces, I think we have two that are gonna live the test of time. Uh, uh, a nice piece called Galliard's Ground mm -hmm. is one. And then uh, Peter Shickley wrote some wonderful pieces for us. And um, more recently, Michael Kamen, mm -hmm. uh, which is a fantastic piece, folk quintet, really fantastic, wonderful oh, piece. You and know, then, you, uh, bring up, you bring up an interesting thing, the Canada Council. Canada made things so different and the other element that was in its heyday that all musicians, and both of us, it's CBC, which is nascent yeah. now, was sadly gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and so tell us about what that did in order to enhance you. And then at, at some point, how did you jump to the next level, uh, i.e. south of the border, to get bigger audiences and et cetera? CBC followed the uh, BBC concept, which was, it's unlikely your artists are going to be heard unless we do something about it. So they had a recording program. They would make, they were called transcription recordings. They weren't for public release, but these recordings were sent to all the radio stations. That gave us an opportunity from year one to start making recordings. Uh, we, this is something that's, well, it's long gone. So by the time we were ready to search for a management, we already had a recording under our arm. We went to New York with a, a, an actual LP before you could make your own LP in a, in a basement. Now it's a, it's a more of a crowded field. How would you delineate yourself from, you know, someone else? It'd be hard because you can, you can make a presentable recording in your own home, <laughs> which is happening a lot now in this particular era. <laughs> but the CBC really presented opportunities to uh, do live shows, uh, live radio and live television which uh, really prepared us. There was a, kind of, if, you, if you think of a skipping stone through water. So we got our experience in CBC playing live radio. We get that LP that we're able to go to New York and get a management and consequently we get sort of known. So we get asked to do a WKXR live radio show. The one hour every week, the Bob Sherman show, one hour they would have a live show. So we were invited to do the live show and we showed up and we set up our music stands and got everything organized and then went off to get a cup of coffee and they were freaking out. Everybody else was nervously preparing and doing everything. They came, they had came searching for us like 10 minutes before, 15 minutes before the show. What are you guys doing? We got this show. Said, oh, okay. Here we, here we come. To us, it was normal. Played our radio show. Okay. So that radio show was heard by the, multi Grammy Grammy winning producer Jay Sachs and he went into his boss uh, at the time Bernstein's producer and said just heard this brass group we've got to talk to them it should be on our label which resulted in an RCA contract 
And it's this sort of thing where one thing leads to another. You just never know. And I guess if there was advice in this, it would be to take every opportunity. Every opportunity is, is teaching you something about the future. And uh, one thing always does lead to another. The, the, the idea of waiting for that great opportunity, it just doesn't happen. The, yeah. the, the opportunity knocks once, you know, we were taught that in school. I hope they don't teach that anymore. <laughs> um, as you uh, put all these things together and coalesced and had the breaks with that, you, you found a couple, from what I understand, you did a showcase or two that really presented you to a wide uh, audience, wide potential mm -hmm. professionals too, that, to exploit your talents, etc. cetera. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? And do those things still exist today for young people in groups? I think they do. Uh, I know in pop, in the pop world, they're constantly there. There's all kinds of support. And what we need to do at any given instance is convince somebody that what we're doing will be as interesting to that audience as a pop, whatever might be the most current thing. Uh, we had showcases here. One was a, a regional one, an Ontario showcase, where they had a 20 minute uh, opportunity to play and be seen by presenters. So, uh, we actually had a choreographer uh, work with us. And this is where the, we were told what I mentioned earlier is you have 20 minutes. Remember that they're going to be watching you for 20 minutes. Don't leave a second out from the minute they see you or hear you, you're on until you're off that stage. You're in charge of your own destiny. So we did choreograph it. Even the way we set our stands, some of, some of it was memorized, some of it we brought the music stand forward. Even when you go to grab the music stand, this sort of thing, remember that you're doing that. Well, that was in the very, very early years. And then uh, later when we got a New York manager, she sent us down to a, uh, a, uh, a student run, and this is all of the United States, a student run symposium like that that lasted for uh, a weekend where they heard the, uh, and acid rock was the big thing right then. <laughs> acid rock and uh, uh, dance, uh, the, it's a combination of rock and dance. That was the big thing and it was all electronic, all, you know, very loud. And we were sandwiched in between these. And again, it was another 20 minute opportunity and we did something similar. And as a result of that, that gave us our first bookings in the United States. Um, those opportunities do exist. And you know, the ones that, uh, that get behind this, um, a lot is ASCAP, BMI, the composers organizations are really worth looking at because they're constantly looking for opportunities for composers to be heard and composers need performers. And uh, it's, it's a good relationship right there. So before you had these great bookings from the manager, it's obviously a big decision to go after trying to get management. Can you tell us about that process and why you ended up choosing the one that you went with? Well, we slid into that kind of easily. Canada, again, was very young <laughs> at that time for performance. So, uh, uh, you knew everybody, the few managers that were there doing things tended to have violinists and, and uh, pianists. So um, we were taken on by the company that was a marketing company. They did Nabisco brands, for example, food, food brands uh, of marketing. And they decided they should, would branch out into entertainment music. And uh, their first client was a fellow named Moe Kaufman, who was famous for writing Swing in Shepherd Blues, which was, uh, now it's a evergreen. I mean, that just goes on forever. And he's a flute player. And basically he was a, a session player here in Toronto. And uh, Leona Boyd, a guitarist who, uh, oh gosh, she was on the Johnny Carson show a dozen times and all kinds of wonderful things. And we were next and there was a writer a uh, young lady there that was a, a marketing writer. And uh, she decided she would really love to work with us. And consequently, our materials, our press materials were first class. We had this amazing writer way before we even knew you needed one. So uh, taking that to New York some years later, we had our LP that I mentioned earlier, plus these wonderful materials that had been developed. So we looked like we were already way out ahead. It just looked like success already. So we uh, checked out all the agencies and the two that gave us the best meetings were Columbia Artists, which was huge, and Casco Hillier, who uh, herself had been uh, 
she was challenging ICM and Columbia at that time. She had Tokyo String Quartet, for example. And uh, Columbia wanted to put us into their community concert. And we knew that was dangerous because the concept of community concerts, it's a wonderful idea for communities. Uh, they'd send somebody out and they'd say, what's your budget? Okay, with that budget, you can get these four artists, the pianist, the singer, and two local groups. And then they sell the concert for the next series. So by the time you show up in the city, there's no marketing. There's no advertising behind that concert because it's already been pre, pre-sold a year earlier. So we decided that would not be a great idea. And, and we, uh, we signed up with uh, Kaziko Hillier, the Hillier agency. She fell in love with the picture on the cover. What a way to get a, a management. I, she looked at the five guys on the front and she just fell in love with it. <laughs> and then she said she took it home and played it for Raphael. And he said, yeah, they sound fine. So she signed us on. <laughs> that, was our, that was our audition for, the, uh, for management, major, so, major uh, management. That, that record that you made was a huge game changer, uh, obviously. And it, in those days, it would be more of a game changer than it is now. But it's different now. I and mean, you, you went to RCA, which is one of the biggest in the world at the time. Uh, what, tell us about that and how you, you went through a couple different labels and how and how can that relate now? What can we do? Like you say, everybody's doing their own thing in their basement, looping right. in. What, right. you know, where, what's, the, what's the history of, of the relationship with the record label and what's the future in your opinion? Well, the labels were pretty simple. You had to sell recordings to stay on a label. So fortunately at the very beginning, their expectation was very modest. So with, um, with RCA, we got to a point where we were uh, selling significant uh, numbers for them. And uh, we talked to them about the future and they said, well, yeah, things are going great. And he said, yeah, but we'd like to do this. We'd like more, you know, how about this and how about that? I said, well, this is crazy talk. I mean, you guys are doing just fine. <laughs> so we found our upward mobility was by changing labels. And we went to CBS and that's where you came in, Marty. Right, right. I remember the CBS. Yeah. And CBS, the first thing they did, they sent us to Germany to work with the Berlin Philharmonic. Mm. Right. And uh, to me, and that's, that's... That's a very interesting oh, point that you bring up. And, and I know you'll verify this. And, and young pr- people don't think about it with managing people and accepting the business part of it. Canadian Brass had their shtick, their show. It was really great. And then you'd want to do something. And then, well, don't, don't change it. You, you don't want to break it if people like what you do. Right. And then you go, okay, I'll go along. And then bookings are dropping a little bit. Hey, guys, you got to come up with something fresh. It was like, <laughs> you, get, you know, and the same thing with record labels. They could be the same thing. Oh, well, let's just, uh, just let's challenge anything. And, uh, and it's, it's very true. And so as you go forward, your relationship with exterior family functions group business music wise very critical mm-hmm. well, it, very much so because your expectations are often way out ahead of the people you're working with so you're, yeah. you're also convincing them and they have to feel like they're integral parts of this and are appreciated in the meantime so you can't just go in and say you crazy people don't get it you have to go in and say wow you wonderful people really get it so we wonder if you could take something like this on I mean it's 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 really a team effort at every juncture. It's, uh, you, you never, nothing happens by itself. There's always somebody, uh, even when it came to negotiating, one thing that we've often, often, often said and continue saying is, it's never about the money. Money is the secondary part. That's the leaves on the tree. It's not the planting it and watering it. That you really want people to do well. You want, you want people around you to do to really profit and, and do well so that they want to work with you. The last thing you want to do is negotiate to the point where nobody, nobody can be successful. It, it just, it just won't develop from that, from that point forward. No. And speaking of, of funding, it's not easy <laughs> to get five people around the country. <laughs> How did you get five people to quit their day jobs and do this? Well, that, you know, that's really important. And I think that's what uh, the big difference between us, Chicago Brass Quintet started in, from my understanding, 1947. That was the symphony guys playing, it was Schilke, Hersef, Arnold Jacobs, so forth. But they were orchestra first and quintet second. Uh, The 
New York Brass Quintet was the next one. I think they're the ones that commissioned uh, the Malcolm Arnold. Uh, American Brass Quintet was next, maybe around 1958. Mm -hmm. And their objective was to be different than the New York Brass Quintet. So they played, they claimed to have played only contemporary music and music written for brass, which somehow included Renaissance, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, so you had these, those were the, the known brass quintets at the time, but New York brass quintet, they were all session players and doing jingles and movies and so forth in New York. We were the first brass guys to just take a deep breath and say, this is it, we're on our own. We're gonna, we're gonna drop everything else. I left the university, Freddie Mills left the National Arts Center Orchestra which was a wonderful job, really. Uh, I think the, uh, the idea was to commit ourselves totally. But what that did on the flip side of that is it meant we were always together. We were either doing the orchestra stuff together in Hamilton, this regional, which was, it was not so busy. And then doing out children's shows, staying together at children's shows, we treated those as laboratories and the fact that we were playing together all the time, we weren't doing day jobs and then getting together at 11 o'clock at night, like a lot of groups were trying to do in New York at the time, I remember specifically. So that meant that everything we were doing, we were comparing notes and, and the process was in motion, going from step to step to step. And it was always very small steps. That's the other thing is that the, the challenges were never beyond us. And, and with all this going on, especially in the beginning, did you guys all get along, like, socially? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Abso absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was that old thing, Marty? I think, I think we heard it when you were in the group. Somebody said, oh, you don't know, a, a clam can't, uh, can't create a pearl without irritation or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was something like that. Now, yeah. Yeah. speaking of... Uh, pearls. One of the there was image was really important, and that the, you the Canadian brass had this image: nice, affable guys, great musicians, unique repertoire, humor, but also the the, the incredible sophistication of the marketing aspect. The gold instruments were a very interesting part of that. That was quite breathtaking to a lot of people. Can you tell us about mm -hmm. where that came from and how where that went? Both uh, Gene Watts, our trombonist, and Freddie Mills. Uh, had a special relationship with Reynolds Schilke. Schilke had been the trumpet player in the, the uh, Chicago Symphony for years, and he left that to run his own instrument company, still exists today, wonderful piccolo trumpets particularly, the high trumpets. Schilke had a dream. Uh, Freddie was the first professional to, to record, and it was Stokowski and the Houston Symphony, to record on a Schilke trumpet. So Shoki treated him like the son he never had. He had a son, by the way, but Freddie was the one he really wanted. <laughs> and uh, uh, so Fred had that relation and Gene had spent a summer uh, working in the Shoki company and staying with Reynolds. So we spent, every time we'd go to Chicago, we would drop in on Reynolds and we all got to know him very well over the years. And uh, he had been the chief designer for Yamaha for years. I think it was way back in the 60s that Yamaha was looking for a scientist. Uh, Reynolds said that they had perfection of manufacturing, but the inside science was all screwed up. And he said that's where he came in. Uh, Yamaha really set the bar on pitch, and that was Schilke. You know, in Germany, the, the word was in Europe that you couldn't have an in-tune instrument that also sounded wonderful. You had to leave the the harmonic series alone, which has its own pitch problems, <laughs> so that you get purity of sound. Uh, and Schilke said, uh, took a different view. He said, no, that can be altered. And uh, Yamaha really did change that back then. I think now everything, all, you can't buy an instrument that plays out of tune anymore, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it might be but at any rate, Schilke wanted to, his dream, his dream was to have a set of instruments, top to bottom, brass instruments, uh, manufactured by one maker himself, Schilke, uh, a la uh, Stradivarius or Granaris. So uh, he did top to bottom uh, gold plate. The tuba was a problem. The Anderson plating, which is uh, world renowned plating, the, the, plating tub was not big enough for the tuba. So Schilke had to do it in two parts. 
and then after the fact put them together and for the life of me to this day i cannot tell you where that join is it was so beautifully done <laughs> that was Sh shoki but that was shoki and it was a full set there'd been gold trumpets and way back in the day that for for expositions and so forth there would be a, a gold uh, inside of a sousaphone bell would be gold plate or something but never a set of instruments so that uh that really did change things and the idea of uh, the, the beauty of those horns. Uh, we had a logo for a while, it was called uh, Canadian Brass is Pure Gold, which mm -hmm. was out. Yeah. 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 Now, I, I know you mentioned this earlier, um, but, and, and I knew that when we talked to you, you also talked about it as well, that one of the goals of the group was to, you know, pulling Carnegie Hall. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the steps that you actually had to go through to make that a reality. And also, if after that performance, if that opened up any doors for the group. Mm -hmm. Well, Carnegie Hall, of course, was the spot. You know, you talk to anybody in the world, it's the most famous concert hall. It's still, you know, Carnegie Hall is right there at the top. And um, that was, uh, you know, the more we started playing in New York, we were in New York a lot. We, were, we played the, the, uh, the Y, 92nd Street Y, I guess it's called. We played there. Uh, various places and of course your aim is to get downtown and play Carnegie Hall and uh, that just hadn't been done before and fortunately we had a we had a public relations company there at the time it was called Gertman and Murtha their claim to fame was the uh, oh Victor Borga for example uh, Victor Borga all the press behind him was the Gertman and Murtha every orchestra that would come to town would hire Gertman and Murtha but we had the Gertman and Murtha and they had done so much around Carnegie Hall. They weren't afraid of Carnegie Hall. So when we started talking about it, they said, okay, let's, let's, let's make it happen. And uh, with their help, uh, we did our Carnegie debut, I guess. And by luck, one of the things that got us into Carnegie, you know, this, this will sound odd to you, but Peter Shickley wrote us an opera called Horn Smoke. Mm -hmm. And a very wonderful reviewer up here in Toronto spent as much time writing the review, I think, as we did rehearsing it, or Peter, it was a really excellent, excellent, nicely written review. And it ended by saying that he, the writer, had, a, had had as much fun watching Horn Smoke as a night at the opera. Well, that got interpreted in New York as they have been called the Marx Brothers of Brass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. He hadn't exactly said Marx Brothers, but he didn't exactly not say it. So we were the Marx Brothers of Brass. And Gert and Murtha said they called the New York Times and they said, well, we'd like you to do a little article on the Canadian Brass. They said, Canadian Brass, what's that? Well, it's a brass group. And he goes, oh, okay, and no, what else? Well, we'll do this and that. Well, maybe we'll think about it. And they're about to hang up. Said, Wait, they've been called the Marx Brothers of Brass. <laughs> they have? <laughs> so there we were on the uh, Carnegie Hall stage. And they made us put on noses and cigars, the five of us. The picture still exists on YouTube somewhere of us in the Marx Brothers, you know, in the, in the noses. At any rate, so that developed press uh, around the idea. And that, that got us onto that show. And we got another nice review, which ended by saying that the performance at Carnegie Hall establishes Canadian Brass as a main hall attraction. And that's pretty important because someone that runs a 2,000 seat hall uh, they can go broke on a, you know, a 60% house or something or half a house. So that was, uh, um, even though we, we were well known by that time with presenters, having done various events and being seen by presenters, still that challenge, a financial challenge of putting a group on stage was huge. And that review kind of sealed the fate that, okay, this group can hold forth in a major hall. And that, uh, that was, a, you know, as they say, a game changer or a defining moment for brass of really hitting the main halls instead of just the chamber music 200, 300, 500 seat halls. Now, did this make an impact um, in the United States uh, and also internationally? Or was it mostly North America, you think? It pretty much was North America. We did play, um, that preceded playing for a, a woman had come from Japan, had come looking for uh, Canadian attractions. And again, another showcase we got to play for, for her. And uh, she brought us to Japan. We did 30 concerts wow. in 1980 in Japan and a lot of press, a lot of uh, really interesting things around that. Unfortunately, and Marty, by the time you were playing with us two years, three years later, uh, Japan was not 
the, the tour was so successful in Japan, uh, Philip Jones Brass Ensemble had been going every other year. Mm -hmm. So this group decided we would do the, uh, the other year. So it'd be Philip Jones Canadian Brass, Philip Jones Canadian Brass. Mm -hmm. Our tour was so successful because of all the press and the television that by the time we were leaving the country, the, the customs agents would come and shake our hand and say goodbye. I mean, it was really a fantastic oh. tour. Well, in Japan, there's a thing that happens in Japan. If somebody in Hokkaido says you have to have the Bruckner 7th played by the Vienna Philharmonic conducted by, well, then everybody in Japan has to have that recording. Bam. Mm -hmm. Well, the tour was so successful that if you were a brass quintet in 1981, the next year, and you didn't go to Japan, you didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Every, every presenter, well, it scorched the earth because what we were doing was so different. But yeah. by the time we came back, in 82, it, it had changed, you know, back to what it had been, which was uh, um, kind of a student event is what had been established mm -hmm. with the Philip Jones. Mm -hmm. And even the Philip Jones book says that somehow we made it hard for them to go back. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. huh. now, so. now for the, the first 30 shows you did there, were, were you guys um, with Yamaha at that point? I know we talked about Shilke earlier. Uh, not really. The Yamaha was a de facto relationship up until the 90s, um, de facto meaning Shoki presented the, them to us and they took care of us and they were nice to us and treated us to dinners. And there was a tax scheme over there where there was entertainment was tax deductible. So they entertained us a lot because that meant they could come out <laughs> to a yeah. nice meal. So it was a nice relationship, but it was a, a de facto mm -hmm. uh, relationship. And then you also I think, acquired a manager in Germany, I believe. Uh, or a European manager. What types of bookings were they able to get you in Europe? Well, that was the uh, the, the other side of that story was uh, going into the cultural, the, the the heartland of brass. If you think of Europe, where where did brass begin? It was there. Philip Jones had had a very successful career in Europe, and he had the finest classical management at that time. And he recommended us to that management, and the management said. Uh, not interested they're not they're not a classical group and they're not a pop group there's something in between and germany is one or the other a music ernst or U music and there's something in the middle so it took a while to actually get established in europe and what happened was a a, a, a woman in uh, stuttgart had been uh, bringing the king singers in erica eslinger she'd been bringing in the uh, king singers and she thought she saw something similar King singers would do their regular show, very much like James Galloway. You'd play a normal show or a classical presentation, and at the end, maybe for encores, you'd play the, the what, did they, what did they call those? Not the bonbons, but you know, the, the fun thing would be at the end, mm -hmm. a penny whistle for James and something cute with the Philip Jones. But that was only as an encore. So uh, Erica, however, thought it might be worth a try and put us into the uh, uh, Ludwigsburg uh, and Marty, I remember you in that particular venue, Ludwigsburg, we were on a pedestal and we had some audience around us. Right. And some very good friends of ours, the Tucci family came and they put them on the stage right at about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock stage right. Well, guess where the horn bell was aimed? <laughs> so, the, so they heard a horn recital where the rest of the audience heard a brass quintet. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I remember that vaguely that stage. It was a little off, you know. <laughs> right, right. But that really uh, that that started our, our European, and it and it turned out as you might expect. Once you get past the critics and the and the management, audiences are just fine. They they have a much bigger appetite than you might imagine. They, we actually got a review at one point in Germany that didn't review us. It revert, reviewed the German audience. And the, the message was. They said the audience could listen with pin drop quietness to Bach and then turn around with the ensemble and hoot and holler to Dixieland. And he was so, so, so proud of the German audience. Yeah. But at that time, <laughs> this, <laughs> this just so, wasn't happening there. So that broke the ice big time. And then uh, we were picked up by a, a, a rock and roll uh, uh, agency that did all the, the absolute top rock and roll stuff, but he had it. the uh, Karsten Janka, the Janka agency, uh, Janka himself loved jazz. And they said he, all the money he earned 
in the pop field presenting, he spent bringing in jazz on jazz groups that he loved. So he spent it all on the music that he really loved. Mm. And uh, he, he took a liking to us and we, uh, we had him as a management for, for years. And that put us on every major stage in Germany, wow. Switzerland. You, you went a number of years, you, you were now established you had a following, you had, you were well-known, so you were booking all the places over Europe and went along. And then uh, as time went on, you were, you were mentioning that you felt like you guys got so good that you created a huge wake of brass out mm -hmm. there. And so it's, you diluted your own golden pond, as it were, a little bit. And then as time goes by, there's just more out there and by the time 2000s roll around, things are mutating and maybe you could call it evolve, but certainly changing. And the personnel, the, the way the group operates is not the same. Can you tell us about how that came about? Well, once the wall came down in Germany, uh, there was a flood of musicians and suddenly you had every kind of musician playing every kind of music everywhere. So for example, we'd show up in a, let's say we'd show up in Hanover and we're walking around during the day and going out to get lunch and we could hear brass quintets standing you know, on the street or on the, the church, uh, church stairs or something. Uh, there was one of our German tours, a young brass quintet played all of our repertoire out in front of the hall as people came to the concert. <laughs> so there was a plethora <laughs> of, yeah. of brass music. But that changed things for everybody, top to bottom, rock and roll to, to string quartet. Um, it made it more difficult to, to uh, well, basically just to take a chance on a, on a 20 concert tour filling major halls. So uh, the next step for us was to have the kind of traditional classical type management, which is the uh, presentation, putting us in, into the classical. So all those years with the pop management, mm. uh, we played for so many people, the brand was in place but we hadn't played the traditional, we hadn't done any of the radio stations in Germany. You know, everybody goes to Germany, the first thing they do are radio. <laughs> we hadn't done any radio and we hadn't done the festivals at all because you don't want to be seen uh, doing a festival and then show up expecting people to pay 60 or $80 for a ticket, mm -hmm. uh, you know, six months later, they'll say, no, I'll wait till they come back for the festival because it's all subsidized. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so consequently, and that's just good business from their standpoint is not to do all the classical venues. So in a sense, our second round, starting roughly in the 2000s, has been the traditional, kind of doing the traditional, uh, we, we hadn't even played with orchestras in, wow. uh, in Europe. So That really came full circle <laughs> yeah. from the start to finish. So now how does the group function with living in, everyone living in different places? How does that change rehearsals and communication? Well, it certainly has made my life easier. We used to rehearse five days a week. We'd get started at 10 in the morning and would quit, you know, 4.30 in the afternoon every single day. If we weren't touring, we were rehearsing. Uh, but it does put more pressure on the, the concentration and value of rehearsal time. So when we do declare a rehearsal week and we all get together in one location, it would be Toronto or maybe Indiana, um, that means that really has to be productive time because we don't have time to spare. I think in a sense, maybe uh, it was kind of casual, you know, in, in Toronto, we'd just get together and listen to each other rehearse, mm -hmm. uh, practice. Mm -hmm. and now you have to come, the practicing has to be done by the time you show up for rehearsal. So in a sense, it's more efficient, but it's uh, maybe not quite as friendly in that, in that certain way. Mm -hmm. What would you guess at this point, having arrived where you are, accomplished all you've accomplished, what could possibly be next for the next 50 years? What, what do you think? Canadian brass, what, what will it be? What will it influence? Well, that's very much on my mind. And, and Marty, we're, we're not so far apart in age. I think you're only 30 years younger than me. Um, <laughs> I wish, yeah. <laughs> it, it, is, it is something to ponder. You know, how, how does somebody start the next, the next run? And basically, uh, uh, the decision was made uh, by Gene and I. We really had to make the decision when people started aging out. Freddie was first. When we started, there was a, at least a 10 year gap. You guys were 10 years older. Three of us were younger and so forth. And then the idea was now do you replace yourself with an old friend, a buddy, somebody you went to school with, or do you go out and search for the finest player in the world? Mm. 
And that was a, a real decision we had, had to make. And we decided that it was important for, for the ensemble that it be the finest player you could find, not, not an old friend or, or whatever. So consequently now I'm playing with, uh, well, three of the players are in their are early thirties. And they're the ones now really have to consider what will that future be? And it's gonna to have to change. You can't, you, you couldn't just play out the Canadian brass repertoire. On the other hand, you don't wanna lose the audience you have and not play the Canadian brass repertoire. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to do, uh, I left my heart in San Francisco, you have to do it. <laughs> Same sort of idea. You just expect that from Canadian brass, you'd expect just a closer walk and maybe the Tacatan Fugue or Little Fugue or something. There are expectations. But on the other hand, what is the next step? And uh, Brandon, Ryan, Brandon Reidenauer is our trumpet player, New York trumpet player. He's a fine composer and also quite a, a fine producer. And this is something that's on the menu of discussion constantly is what are the next steps? How do we take advantage of, say, even this electronic era? Mm -hmm. These guys went to school. I think it was Zed, the, the um, uh, electronic artist, Zed. He's probably mm -hmm. one of the top three in the world. Yeah. They, went to, they went to school with him at Juilliard, for example. Mm -hmm. um, well, how is it that someone from Juilliard would go off that direction and other ones went into a brass quintet and maybe there is a convergence. Maybe there's a possibility of these musics coming together. So this is a topic. Uh, Brandon also is a fine pianist. He's been playing piano on some of our concerts. The Christmas show, we had a piano on stage every night and did several with the piano. And that's already a, that's a fairly large departure in the old think. It's a small step in the new, the new think of uh, yeah. the ensemble. Yeah. So how are you able to balance your personal life and your professional life all this time? Being on the road and traveling so much? Well, the, uh, the advent of the uh, portable telephone changed everything. In the early years, it was very difficult. When you were out of town, you were out of town. We had more friends in Japan in the 80s than we did back home in, in Toronto because we were there. When we'd go to Japan, we'd kind of sit still in Tokyo and do all these runouts, and we got to know a lot of people. And then come home, you'd be home for two or three days, and off you went again. And if you were home, it was kind of a hideout. You didn't want to be you know, socializing or hanging out and so forth. So that was difficult. Now what I've noticed uh, with the younger guys, uh, two of the fellows have young children, like really young. One's uh, under a year old and the other has a four and eight, five, yeah, four and eight, I think. And they're constantly on the FaceTime. They're, uh, uh, Jeff, our horn player, has breakfast with his family. He gets up and they do a FaceTime breakfast. He'll try to do dinner as well sometimes. And then he plays games with them all night. The internet has changed everything. It's also changed when you ask about the next, the, the next 50 years, maybe for the Canadian brass. The internet changed everything. It used to be we would, we, would, we would throw some LPs in the back of our car and drive off to a regional concert in Ontario and hope to sell LPs and break even so that people would take the record home and be able to see our picture and listen to us after we were gone. Well, now our biggest fan base, I think the United States is number one. Number two is uh, Germany. Number three, it's coming out of South America. Mm. And we won't play one concert ever in South America. Brazil, we went on, well, we played Mexico twice, but Brazil, one concert. Mm. It's not because of our live performances. Yet we have this huge uh, fan base in South America. The internet is a godsend to classical music. Uh, I think the complaints that you've heard about the internet are from people that used to make a fortune, particularly pop guys, made a fortune on re recordings and concert tours. And that wasn't the classical musician. The classical musician wanted to be heard. The idea that uh, uh, it's not tied to money so much as pop world. So classical musicians, it's, it's, a, it's a heyday in being able to put your piece of music and have somebody from Belgium write and say, hey, I really love this, or somebody from uh, South Africa, right, and say, uh, you know, we're starting to look like your guys got any ideas. It's just changed. Talk about a game changer. It, it's put the, on an international basis, but different than they used to refer to international. International meant you ran back and forth between Europe and North America. Now yeah. it's international 
Yeah. Now we're in a completely different time <laughs> with this COVID-19 virus. And how has that really changed your season and your plans for what you're going to come up with next? Well, we're, we're postponed right through November right now. I think there are two concerts in the summer that are still kind of holding on, but that's the most unlikely ones. Um, so that meant everything had to be pushed a year forward. Uh, so that means everybody's at home thinking this through and we are developing some ideas. One is uh, very strong, and we're just doing it this very minute, is all kinds of duets, duos, written based on our repertoire. So there'll be an Amazing Grace duet, uh, Little Fugue duet and so forth. And the idea is that they are first class music, it's stuff associated with us and it's playable. We will record the tracks and then someone can play a duet with Jeff, for example. And the idea, it's, it's kind of, it's a flex idea so that the tuba player has as much opportunity. They have the, you play any part you want. You play the melody, you play the second part, third, fourth, whatever you wish. So it's flex in the sense of you're not tied to triplet gets a melody all the time, horn gets all the offbeats, and the tuba has to play the bass. You can switch it around. So this is uh, uh, something we can do immediately and something people can do at home on their own, which will be fun. All right. Well, another question that, that I have for you is if you had to start all over again, what would you do the same? What would you diff do differently? And also, what advice do you have for, for young groups? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, I think if doing it again, we'd have to rethink the whole process because nothing like we talked about CBC is in demise. Uh, records, LPs, cassettes, DVDs, CDs, almost a thing of the past. Uh, so it would have to be a completely different. But So the advice would be, what stays constant is keeping your ears open, take every opportunity you can to perform and don't turn down anything. Don't, uh, don't decide that uh, you're already great. Well, I'm not, I don't think I'll do that or I won't do that. You, <laughs> you see what, you just don't know what, what will lead to what. You just take every opportunity to get out there and play. Mm -hmm. All right, Chuck, well, we have a few questions from audience members. So we were gonna go oh. ahead and ask those now. So the first <laughs> question comes from Patrick Young in Boulder, Colorado. And he asks, what common issue do you find most brass quintets have and how do you go about fixing those issues? Uh, I think the first issue of a brass quintet is um, of, of allowing people to be themselves and not just start uh, telling everybody how they need to play or act or be, rather to, to listen and look and see how you can use everybody's individualities. Mm. And uh, the other things work out, pitch, rhythm and all that. There's always somebody that has a strength in that area and, and there it's up to the person who's, who's not as strong perhaps is to copy, jump in, be part of the process. And this is chamber music is really blending. Horn players know most about that, blending horn players. Have to <laughs> we try. <laughs> also along those lines, he asks what your audition process is like for the Canadian Brass and how you choose your members when you do have to find a new one. It's never an unknown talent we're looking for. It's not going to be somebody that nobody knows and suddenly we find somebody and extract them out of, out of uh, uh, complete uh, unknown person. Uh, it's going to be somebody that's already played. You call everybody, you call everybody you know. We found Marty simply by the fact that we'd heard him on the radio. Uh, <laughs> it's symphony over and over again. You already know where these players are. And somebody's going to suggest, um, an interesting one was uh, when uh, Bernard Scully, French horn, joined us. Uh, Gene called his old friend Roland Pandol Pandolfi. I think they'd been in an orchestra together along the way, and he called Roland and said, and uh, Roland said, out of all the years I've been teaching, this is a guy you have to hear. So he came and played for us, and sure enough, Roland was right. But it, it's always there's some connection that you're, you're going to hear about a, a player that is a potential. Then when you get all your potentials together, you also want to make sure it's somebody that you, you blend with uh, even uh, socially. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you couldn't have uh, a wild, tattooed, earringed, long-haired, uh, only wear shorts, whatever, and put them in with, with a group that is different. Uh, we've always been a very moderate group and everybody has to be kind of moderate. That doesn't mean you can't, again, doesn't mean you don't have differences. It just means you're not getting wildly. Uh, orchestras sometimes run into this by auditioning behind screens. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily always get people to get along together. There can sometimes be even in fist fights. Who knows? Well, we've never had that problem because it, you know, we do have that opportunity to uh, make sure that there's, there's uh, some relationship. Mm, gotcha. <clears throat> this question comes from Carson Nolting in Longmont, Colorado. And he asks, how do you find places to practice and rehearse when you're on the road? Uh, we always get time in the hall. You can always put in uh, um, a dress rehearsal of some nature. So we always reserve the hall about an hour and a half before a concert and we'll play for at least a half an hour just to talk things through or touch things. In the event we're doing a recording or something down the road a couple of weeks, we'll extend that. We'll make that into a, a, a full blown rehearsal, stretch it out for a couple hours. Uh, so we're always calling ahead and asking for the halls. In the event we can't, we'll ask the hotels if they have a meeting room that we can either use. Usually they just let us do it. Often though, if they can't, they'll rent it to us, but you can always get a rehearsal space. So we catch as catch can. <laughs> All right, and this one comes from Adrian Gutierrez in Denver, Colorado. And he asks, what is your fondest memory during your tenure with the Canadian Brass? Well, there's so many, but just, <laughs> but looking at Marty as we're talking, and I, it just brings back a flood of memories. And going to Berlin was amazing. That that yeah. duo when we uh, played with the Berlin, Berlin Philharmonic brass players, yeah, that was a that was a time in history. You know, Berlin is not the same now. Uh, it, you know, a lot of people say, "Hey, it's a lot better. It's all open and all that." But we saw Berlin at a certain time. We stayed at the Kempinski Hotel. I recall, very mm -hmm. historic spot. Yeah. Hot. And uh, it was just, it was just wonderful. Well, that was special. That was the first CBS record, right? Yes. Yeah. So there was a lot riding on that. They wanted it to be, yeah. you know, and we were bridging the gap between the continents too. Right. Mm -hmm. and, you, you might recall, we, we, we thought, first of all, the, uh, the producer uh, spoke German to the Germans and English to us back and forth, back and forth. So we assumed, because these guys weren't saying anything, we thought they only spoke German. And we had a little joke just to start. We thought it'd be fun. So we were doing the canon was the first piece. So we said, well, we're going to perform. We've listened. We're going to do the Von Karyon Temple. And you know, can't ba 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 ba. Von Karyon Temple. We go, ba, ba, ba. <laughs> Not a, a single smile. These guys are like counting. <laughs> Okay, let's get to work. And by the, <laughs> by the end of the week, th three days in, these guys were, were, well, Marty, you and the tuba player were hanging out together. They, yeah, the tuba player clear. had been in, interlocking for a couple of years. They spoke, then we were fine. <laughs> but at first, that very, <laughs> it started out so serious. Yeah. It was really, that was, a, that was a magic moment. All right, so now something for a slightly different flavor. We have so, Marty, who's going to yeah. bring you up his questions. Five questions I want to ask you. Uh oh, uh oh, They're not complex. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. We just didn't. The check's on the way. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Chuck. What is your favorite note? Oh gosh. <laughs> I've never really thought of that. Um, 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 I'll pick a C. Just a, a C. good open C on the top. That's easy to see. Okay, so tell us a story, a time you fell flat and how you turned it into a sharp situation. So you turned something that didn't work out, but you turned it around. Tell us, give us an example of how you bounced back and landed on your feet. Well, we were in uh, Pennsylvania. I'll never forget making a, an odd moment. We were doing horn smoke and I had a, a cross on my back because I was the preacher. So I had this out of white tape, a giant cross on the back of a black robe. And at intermission, the brass players, as a present to us, they were out in the hall playing Verdi. And it just sounded great. So uh, Gene went out and put his hands through the curtain to applaud, just to say it was nice. And I thought, that was great. So I went running up to the front, put my hands out, but I kept going. I fell into the 
could have been anything. It could have been a 40 foot pit. Fortunately, it was carpeted and the seats were back. So there I was on the ground. So how do you turn this around? Do I crawl out? So I decided to just get up, reach up, pull myself back up. And it was, so I guess that must have been about six feet high. Pulled myself up and got back on stage. So afterwards they said it looked like somebody had thrown a sack of potatoes out. <laughs> and, then, and then it was like, because the cross, it was like an ascension went up into the... So oh. save that situation. That's cool. That's cool. Cool. Now, if you had to do it all over again, and you didn't choose this profession, you look like you pretty well were, you know, seal, signed, sealed, and delivered in music. But what would you have chosen if it wasn't this? Well, other, I was going to be a band director. That was still, but still in music. If if it hadn't been music, um, I was really interested. In, I wanted to be a chiropractor. I thought it'd be really, really fun to. I love chiropractic adjustments, and I had a great uncle that. Uh, anytime I'd go up and see my grandmother for summers, I'd, I'd get the uh, the adjustment. So I was getting like adjustment every day. It was just it felt fantastic. So that always seemed uh, really interesting to me. Cool, but, uh, cool. Now, what's your favorite word and your least favorite word? Well, one of my favorites now is codify, and that came from you, Mark, Marty. You always wanted to codify things. Let's get this organized. So you use codify. And my most not favorite words are one that you hear, ones that you hear too often, but they are not ones that I would even mention. So those are, I don't like, I, it's never been pleasant to my ear to hear people swearing. So mm -hmm. just generally it's oh, not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. So last question, give us a recommendation for something that you love, that you think we should take a look at. Well, you probably already do, but uh, I think everybody has to have at least one and probably two cappuccinos every day. Mm -hmm. And if you can, and if you can get single source uh, cappuccino, that's that's the best, that rather than the blended. Uh, it, and if it's done really well, it's just the best. It's just the okay. Best. But we spend all, on a road looking for the always look. We used to look for the worst Mexican restaurant. We oh. eat every lunch would be Mexican, and we were always trying to find the worst one. And just when we thought we'd find it, sure enough, the next day there'd be one worse. Oh. <laughs> so that was that quest. Now it's looking for the best cappuccinos. <laughs> I would think finding the worst Mexican restaurant would be really dangerous <laughs> if you're about to play a concert. <laughs> <laughs> we do love Mexican food. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Chuck, it's been an absolute pleasure. We're so happy to have you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you once again, Chuck, and for taking time to tell us about your story and about your career. And I'd also thank everybody who took the time to, to come watch us speak with Chuck and hear everything mm -hmm. he had to say. Um, also, be sure to like our Brass House Network page on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more information upcoming installments. And from Natalie, Marty, and myself, we hope to see you all again for the next episode of Sharp Ideas. And stay safe and stay sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, guys. Um, sharp Ideas is a Brass House Network production. It is hosted by myself, Jonathan Batia, and Martin Hackman. Our team consists of Miranda DeBlawe, Lucas Teston, and Joe Venezia. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>